We're so glad to have all of you here tonight. And starting the Feb Bird Society of Women Philanthropists, our intention was to honor Beth and to educate, empower, and inspire women to be philanthropic leaders at Tennessee Wesley. And thanks to all of you, we're doing that. Last spring, we invited all the departments to apply for a grant to fund a special project. And I'm glad to say we received 11 worthy applications, and the committee awarded $5,000 to Health and Human Performance and $2,500 to the Religion Department. Those on the committee, Alex Sharp, Susan Buttram, Pam Gallery, and Sandra Boyd, they were all very specific that the project had to involve the community. And both of these selections are absolutely doing that. HHP had wanted to go out into the community with their students to do exactly what they could do, but they didn't have the equipment. But thanks to your generosity, they have purchased assessment equipment, which includes heart rate monitors, blood pressure machines, stadiometers, scales, dynameters, pedometers, and jump ropes. And scheduled for October are visits to the Athens City School to educate them on the importance of being physically fit. And in November, HHP students will go to the McMahon Senior Activity Center to perform fitness assessments for local seniors and working with them to improve their numbers. In the spring, the Religion Department will present several programs involving women in ministry, not just those serving in churches and synagogues, but also women in ministry with programs in the community. Katie Morgan Harper is working on those programs, and we'll hear more about that in the coming months. As you can see, we've been very busy, and we couldn't do any of these things without you. You have an opportunity, if you haven't, to join the Fed Society with yearly dues of $500, faculty and staff, $250 here, and you can deduct that from payroll, and I think that's $20.83 a month. I hope that's right, Gail. And if you are a teacher, or you've ever been a teacher, that's $250. So if you want to join tonight, you can do that. Where is Tracy? Tracy, raise your hand. You can see Tracy. Okay, now to our speaker. Elaine Weiss is a Baltimore-based journalist and author whose feature writing has been recognized from prizes for the Society of Professional Journalists, and her byline has appeared in many national publications, and her stories have also been on NPR. Elaine's book about women's suffrage, the women's hour, the great fight to win the vote, has won a claim from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Christian Science Monitor, and the New Yorker, all hailing it as a riveting, nail-biting political thriller with powerful parallels to today's political environment. She's been deeply involved in bringing the story of the women's fight for enfranchisement, enfranchisement to the citizens of Tennessee beyond her book, she has spoken at audiences ranging from the East Tennessee History Center to the Tennessee State Library and Archives, Tennessee State Museum, the Tennessee Bar Association, numerous universities in the state, and now at Tennessee Wesleyan. We are very glad to have you this evening. the Fed Bird Society and Fed herself at her own alma mater. That's, it, it makes it all very special to me to be here where she went to school uh, and with members of her own family with us tonight. So it's, it's very special. Um, Fed attended what um, was called U.S. Grant College, am I correct at that time? Uh, what Tennessee uh, Wesleyan was known as when she was here in the late 19th century. And at the time, very few women actually went to college. 
It's called we're affording higher education. And so that's something uh, special <clears throat> right there. Betty chose to become a teacher and to pass her love of reading and learning and doing to future generations. And I'm sure her time at this college really helped shape her, helped her, uh, influenced her intellectually, shaped her character, and she became the woman she, she was with strong identity, a uh, strong values, and strong opinions about the role of women in society. Um, and those attributes would someday, in her own <coughs> way, make history. I'm delighted to return to East Tennessee. Uh, I've been here several times before. And this region, in particular, um, has a special hold on, on the enfranchisement of women. Um, again, I attended the dedication of suffrage monuments all over the state, uh, including here in Knoxville, which was a very spectacular event, um, also in Nashville, in Jackson. Uh, it was only the pandemic that kept me going from going to Memphis. And um, I helped develop the Votes for Women room at the National Public Library. If you've not seen that, you really should know. It's a, a really amazing uh, interactive <clears throat> um, exhibit and videos and uh, interactive maps. Uh, it has uh, an original uh, history of women's suffrage by volume set signed by Susan B. Anthony. So it's a great place to go visit. And I was given a wonderful tour of Nyota and Halpern by my <clears throat> friend and historian colleague Tyler Boyd. So I'm glad to be able to bring the story of the fight for ratification of the 19th Amendment back home to you in East Tennessee. And remember, this, this battle that Ben Byrne plays a surprising role in was one of the greatest political battles in our nation's history. It was such an important moment for our nation. And this is your story, and Fred Byrne is your alumna, and you should be rightfully proud. And I gather that her story was not really well known for some time. And I'm pleased if my book, The Woman's Hour, helped to bring her back into the public consciousness. Uh, others played uh, a very important role in that too. And um, not just her letter to Harry which is what she is usually celebrated for. But Fed's own courage in standing up for women's equality at a time and in a place when that was not a popular stand. It was a courageous act on her part. So the 19th Amendment of the Constitution was the largest extension of the franchise in our nation's history. Never been received. It gave the vote to half of the citizens of the nation who were not included when the founding fathers established our government. The story of the 19th Amendment and its eventual acceptance is really a story about how constructive change can be made in a democracy and in a society. So the 19th Amendment was not just a legal change. It wasn't just the Constitution. It wasn't just an election law change. It didn't just double the national electorate. It didn't just make women full citizens for the first time. It marked a societal change, a cultural shift in the role and the rights of women. And that change is still ongoing. And that argument is still ongoing. The fight for women's suffrage, which is what I wrote about, what FIP is known for, is one of the defining civil rights battles in our history. It's one that cuts to the heart of what democracy means. Who gets to participate in our government? Who has a voice? And when we say, we the people, what do we really mean? Do we mean everyone? And we are asking them some questions. In the summer of 1920, 
which is now 104 years ago. One last state was needed to ratify the 19th Amendment and make it part of the Constitution, make it the law of the land. And we give every woman, every woman citizen over the age of 21, so 21 um, in every state, the right to vote in every election. 35 states have ratified, and that 36 were needed, or three quarters of the 48 states in the Union at the time. You didn't have Hawaii in Alaska. And that one more state turned out to come down to Tennessee. It could be the 36th state. It could be what was called the perfect 36th. And if the Tennessee legislature approved the amendment, it would become the law of the land. If the amendment <coughs> failed in Tennessee, it could, the amendment could be delayed indefinitely and perhaps never connected. In fact, the pendulum was swinging in public opinion, in political will, and there was a great question if it didn't pass in Tennessee, it might die. And the enfranchisement of half of the citizens of the United States were at stake. It all came down to Tennessee. And finally, to one vote, Harry Now by 1920, the suffragists, those who advocated for, for uh, women's right to vote, had been fighting for the vote for 72 years. Since that first outrageous demand for the vote was <laughs> made by Elizabeth Cady Stanton at the Seneca Falls, women's rights meeting in 1848, State New York. Now, women's rights is something of an oxymoron in the 19th century America because, besides being denied the ballot, American women also did not have the right to testify in a court of law or bring civil suit. A woman could not bring suit against another person. They could not be judged by a jury of their peers because women could not serve on juries. They could not be admitted to most universities. Actually, um, Tennessee Wesleyan being an exception to that, a really happy exception. Um, and it's really rare to have a co-education facility. Uh, the ones that came in the late 19th century were single sex, they were women's colleges. Um, educating women was actually considered a waste of time. And their destiny, in popular opinion, was only to be wives and mothers. And educating women was actually considered dangerous. <laughs> Conventional li medical wisdom at the time, and this is actually documented, um, in the mid 19th century, held that women were too fragile and nervous to handle deep study. And if they did stay, the blood, <coughs> their blood flow would be diverted to their brains from their reproductive organs, <laughs> endangering their ability to bear children. The entire species would be at risk if they had an education. This is real. This is real. If a woman was married in the 19th century, any property or wages belong to her husband. And gradually got changed by state laws, but it took a long time. She had no custodial rights to her children. If she left the marriage, she left the children. Her husband owned the children. Um, and she was not supposed to speak in public. <coughs> that could be a risk. Um, Elizabeth Stanton tackled these at the Seneca Falls meeting, she actually demanded equal pay for equal work. We're not there yet. But this was 1848, and she demanded that, and she demanded that women have the right to vote. In the years following Seneca Falls, tens of thousands of dedicated American women waged over 900 state, local, and national campaigns to win the ballot. And to me, it's hard to imagine how difficult, how brave these women must have been to stand up publicly for political equality. Because we know Fred Berman, but 
we also know that women who did this endured contempt and ridicule in their communities, in their churches, in the press, even in their own families and among their neighbors. They were pelted with rotten eggs and spoiled vegetables. They were attacked by mobs of angry men. They were imprisoned and tortured. They were denounced as radicals, perverts, traitors, anarchists, bad wives and mothers, of course, even Bolsheviks. <laughs> they were divide, uh, derided as unattractive, unsexed, she-men. Why would a woman want to vote? She should have her husband vote for her. And the men who supported suffrage, men who proudly called themselves suffragettes, were belittled by those who opposed this idea as Mingles and Nancys. <laughs> Clearly, the suffragists were frightened. Now, organizing in Tennessee was not at all easy. Uh, Southern social mores and traditions, that pedestal that Southern women were supposed to be, to be placed on, was intended to keep women in her domestic sphere, at home, out of the public sphere. And her delicate nature might be sullied by touching politics or even touching the ballot box. And these were all arguments that we used to keep women from voting. And despite all this, Tennessee women did stand up, white and black women, and they became activists. They paraded through the city's, uh, state cities, they made public uh, speeches on soapboxes and on podiums. They lobbied the legislature, all very unladylike. Tennessee suffragists were led by strong women like Lizzie Crozier French, uh, founded the Knoxville Equal Suffrage Society, the Tennessee State Suffrage Association president, and active on the national scene. Abby Crawford Milton of Chattanooga, first president of the Tennessee League of Women Voters. Elizabeth Merriweather in Memphis. And Frankie Pierce and Dr. Maddie Coleman organized Nashville's African American women to work for suffrage. Nashville's and Dallas Dudley made it respectable for society women to uh, be suffragists. And Jackson's Sue Shelton White returned home to Tennessee to lead the ratification fight in Nashville for the National Women's Party. Now, when the federal suffrage amendment was finally passed by Congress in 1919 after World War I, after being ignored for 40 years in the Congress, it was actually um, introduced in 1876, um, was voted down 27 times, and went to the states for ratification, and eventually came to Tennessee for the deciding vote. And there were powerful forces working against women's suffrage in Tennessee. There were political, corporate, and ideological foes, each with their own reasons for opposing women voting. Politicians feared this unpredictable new electorate. Who knew how women were going to vote and 27 million women across America would be eligible to vote? Clergymen, many who opposed this, because they believe voting went against the will of God, that she had made, purposely made Eve subservient to Adam, and that's how it should be. Corporations that believe women would be bad for business. Um, textile manufacturers feared that if women voters could, could vote, they might want to abolish child labor. And the mills of Tennessee and other places rely on that The labor industry feared that women voters would insist on strict enforcement of prohibition, which it just has in copies. But the most passionate foes of the 19th Amendment turned out to be women opposed to, to their own <coughs> And that was, at first, kind of shocking to me. But many of these antis, as they call it, antis, social and religious conservatives who really fear, genuinely fear, that suffrage would bring about a 
profound shift in gender roles <coughs> and the danger of the American home if a woman was considered equal to her husband. And they bring about what they saw as the moral collapse of the nation. <coughs> in essence, it would alter private life, not just public life. It was more than just public life. And this is an important reminder that the debate over women's suffrage, as other debates in our uh, national life, was never just a political argument. It was also a social and cultural and moral debate about women's role in society, a uh, precursor to what we now call the cultural wars. So all sides confront one another in national, and it gets wild. Um, there's bribes and booze and propaganda and blackmail, conspiracies and kidnappings and fist fights. The newspapers call it suffrage Armageddon. The outcome remains in doubt until the very last moment. I won't scroll it for you, but it does come down, as you know, to a single vote of conscience from the youngest member of the Tennessee legislature who receives a letter from his mother and that mother is Bedford. Now, Harry was 24 years old in his first term of the legislature. And from Bedford's writings, I gather she was not thrilled that he had entered politics. She thought it was a dirty business, and she was actually hoping he would not run again. Um, but Harry found himself in a really tough spot. He was the protege of the most outspoken suffrage opponent in the legislature. State Senator Herschel Camper of Athens. Harry was reading law under Camper, so his profession was going to be decided by this man. He was his political mentor and sponsor. And Burns constituents, constituents in Iowa were mostly against ratification. So what was he going to do? Personally, <coughs> raised by a strong, well-educated mother, educated hero, Harry believed women should have the right to vote. But politically, it was very dangerous for him to act on that. So he wore a red rose, a symbol of opposition to suffrage, in his lapel and made it clear to the world that he intended to vote against it. Then, on the morning of the vote, he received a seven page letter from Fed, written in pencil. You can see it, it's really a wonderful thing to look at. It's on the website of the Knoxville Public Library, part of Emerson's own historical uh, collection. And it's very much a mother's letter to her son. It's filled with family news and neighborhood gossip and the weather and a shopping list, instructing Harry to buy some sheet music for her when he was in Nashville. And it also urges him to come out and support the event. It wasn't a simple thing for her to do, or for him to do, to urge him to do this. There would be consequences. After Harry cast his decisive vote, and he did have to leave the, the uh, state house through a window and make his way on a ledge, um, he tore off his red rose. But the anti-suffragists in the legislature were so incensed that he changed his mind accused him of taking a bribe. And they actually got people to, to, to swear they witnessed this, which was total fabrication. And um, he had to defend himself standing in the well of the legislature. He had to defend his good name. And the anti suffragists sent the president of the Southern Women's Rejection League to Hapburg in Nairobi. And Feb sent this telegram to Aunt Abby Milton, who was head of the Tennessee suffragists. And she said, woman was here today, claims to be the wife of the governor of Louisiana, which it was, and Pleasant, and tried by every means to get me to refute and say that the letter I sent to my son was false. The letter is authentic and was written by me. I stand squarely behind suffrage and request my son to stick to suffrage until the end. This woman was very insulting to me, and I had a hard time to get her out of my home. That same afternoon, 
that received a much more welcome communication from Carrie Catt, who was the international president of, of suffrage, of the, uh, the largest suffrage organization in America and also uh, the international suffrage league. And she wrote to Fed, you are blessed with a brave and honest son. Whatever the enemies of justice and decency may do now to show their vengeance upon him, he is bound to have a great future, and you will ever be proud of him. That's what I love to hear In the days after Harry's vote, the anti suffragists organized an indignation rally here in Hoops, denouncing Harry and protesting his vote, and reportedly gathered 700 signatures of uh, various citizens demanding that he retract. And they held similar um, rallies around the state. And things got really, really ugly. And a few weeks later, this isn't talked about very much when we celebrate the ratification of Tennessee's role. But not, even though the 19th Amendment had been already proclaimed as part of the US Constitution, the Tennessee legislature actually rescinded its ratification. Now, it had no effect. It was only symbolic. But you can see how controversial that vote, Harris vote, really, really was. And still, the citizens of Niagara and Newton County did reelect him to be their representative in the legislature in the fall election. The governor, however, went down for his suffrage. Harry went on, as you probably know, to a distinguished career as an elected official and a civic leader. But what I find so remarkable and inspiring is that Van Byrne was courageous enough not only to press her son to support women's equality, to do the right thing, she said. She was brave enough to take very controversial stand herself of continuing to live within her own community. Right here. It's easier to be an iconoclast and then when you're able to leave. Carrie Cat could leave. Alice Paul and her opinions could leave. But not to have to face your neighbors and friends and your fellow parishioners in church who vehemently disagree with your stance. Fed faced them all with a smile and the strength of her convictions. And those were very progressive convictions for a woman of her time and her sex. So she challenges us all to ask ourselves, what would I do for my community? if I were in Beckham's place at that time, and the stakes were so high. And my son's political career was at stake too. So what are, am I, what are you doing to promote equal rights for all today in your own life, and voting rights for all, and to create healthy, inclusive communities and a vibrant democracy? What are we doing in our own lives that would match what Fed has done? Her lesson, her profiling courage really does live on. And I'm pleased to report to you that Fed has been in the news a lot in recent weeks. Last month, some of you probably know, in a prime time speech at the Democratic National Convention, former Secretary of State and Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton gave a shout out to Fed. Uh, noting her pivotal role in Tennessee's ratification and women's enfranchisement. And she made a very big deal at the beginning of her, her talk about Fed's courage. And Fed is now singing on Broadway. Yes, she is. She is a featured character with her own solo song in the second act in the Broadway musical Sus. Um, it was nominated for six Tony Awards. It won two of the most prestigious ones for the best original script and score. And that scene, the Fed singing of the Rose <coughs> Harry and Harry's surprise boat, brings down the house every time. I can testify to that. I hope Tennessee Wesleyan's Fed Burn Society gets a similar standing ovation and your support as it makes strength, makes plans to strengthen 
the Athens community in our hometown. So thank you very much. Pleasure to be here.